So uh, what are the three things that are certain in life in 2024? <laughs> well, at least we know two of them, right? Death and taxes. So these two are universal. <laughs> they never change. But what is the third thing? AI startups. <laughs> yeah, you have AI correct. Well, I would say the third thing in 2024 would be AI is actually changing humanity. So last year, I saw this article that some law firms are using gender AI to draft legal documents. And some startups even try to use AI to help clients argue in court as opposed to using a human attorney. So here, I think it's important to define what we mean by AI. And I want to uh, use uh, Mark Rido's definition. AI, uh, in the context of this talk, refers to algorithms that perform tasks or behaviors that a person would reasonably deem to require intelligence of human to do so. Uh, of course, uh, AI is too much an umbrella term, and in this talk, I sometimes use it to refer to non-traditionally AI things. But for the sake of uh, simplicity and consistency, I'm just going to use AI throughout the talk to refer to a bunch of uh, these kinds of algorithms. So despite the promises of AI, I think there has always been a gap between what AI can do and how AI can serve humanity. In the 90s, uh, Rich Karana's research project found that doctors actually prefer rule-based models over better performing neural nets. Does anybody want to know why? Yes? There's something to do with explainability, like with the rule base, you can see how the decision was made, whereas the neural net, you might not be able to figure that out. Precisely, that was the case. So rule-based models allow the doctor to see the list of rules AI used to make a diagnosis or to predict the risk of pneumonia, as opposed to neural nets that function as a black box that doesn't allow any changes or any correction of AI mistakes. Was this paper published? Uh, it's, uh, I think it's the 90s, but I, the day was uh, cut off in this image. Yeah, You can search for the title. It's, it's published in KDD, if I remember correctly. <laughs> well, this paper, I, actually, I was wrong. This paper was probably published much later, but the project I mentioned was in the 90s. So this particular paper is, uh, I think it's in the 2000s. All right, so how do we close this gap? I believe by conducting human-centered design, we can close this gap to some extent. For example, in this project, I work with my students and pathologists to consider how we can use AI to help them examine histopathology images. And there is no shortage of AI models for pathology these days. Just to give you some ideas, here are a bunch of uh, existing startups working in this space. However, there is currently a lack of consensus about the adoption of AI amongst pathologists because AI as of now is still not good enough to completely replace humans. So it's really unclear then how AI could fit into a human pathologist's workflow. To tackle this problem, we conducted human-centered design few studies with pathologists from UCLA Health. Our key finding was that pathologists could work with AI just like how they work with a trainee in the way that they can see AI's findings as if AI as a trainee reporting back to them and they serve as the expert following a top-down workflow to verify these AI findings. So here's the use interface we design based on these insights. A pathologist would start by seeing the AI's result. Here it shows is WHO grade three tumor. And then they will see at the top level a number of criteria based on which the AI model comes up with this diagnosis. And it shows that mitosis is the top uh, most important criteria in this case. And then they can drill down to one level deeper to see a list of evidences based on which AI uh, identify mitotic cells. 
as well as the saliency map to show that AI is indeed focusing on the cell, but not some other non-relevant information. So if they're still unsure, they can pick some of these sample evidences and then drill down to the original slide with full context of the image to verify that AI is indeed making the right decision on this particular part of the image. And along the way, if they see any mistakes, they can override those uh, decisions and the entire uh, diagnosis, if necessary, will be updated. In a study with 12 pathologies from three medical centers, within less than an hour of training, they could achieve more accurate grading using this tool called CrossPath compared to an existing digital tool. I think this project I just showed you is an example of how human-centered design can close the gap between what pathology AI can do and how this kind of AI can actually help pathologies work. So generally speaking, my research goal is to develop interactive systems that can catalyze AI advances by working towards three levels of human-centered objectives. Augmenting human abilities, assimilating human intents, and uh, aligning with human values. So next I would uh, give you some examples uh, for one of these, each of these three levels. For augmenting human abilities, which is actually the majority of my work in the past five years, I have explored the space of medical diagnosis and research, mechanical and robotic design, and uh, text reading. So to give you an example, I want to focus on the second area, mechanical and robotic design. So in this project, uh, which is the, actually the, my, the last project of my PhD, so if people ask me, uh, when did you change your research from fabrication to AI? So this is the kind of the, the point where I realized hmm, there is something that is really interesting. Uh, it's, so it's called generative design, even though we're not really using generative AI in particular. So the goal in this project was uh, we want to augment humans' abilities to design both structure and appearance. Structure and appearance are both important but they often trade off each other in the traditional mechanical design tasks. Existing tools often prioritize structural integrity, but they lack the interactiveness for users to explore uh, within the goal of structural integrity, how can I explore appearances? To understand this tool called Forte, let's uh, walk through the process of using it to design a leg for a quadruped robot. To start, the user would perform some simple sketches and describe the loading scenario. So here's the original uh, robotic leg we want to redesign. And the user can just sketch some shapes like this curvy uh, structure they want to create this, uh, the robotic leg of. And then they will also specify the load, which is the weight of the robot's body onto this leg as well as the bulging condition, which is where uh, this, this robot leg makes contact with the world on the ground. As well as the design domain, you can think of it as a bulging, uh, as a bounding box that uh, covers the space in which uh, this leg can take place. After these simple sketches and annotations, next the user can use Forte to generate structures based on the sketch. For example, uh, the user can ask the tool to add additional support because the initial sketch might not be sturdy enough to support the weight. So here, uh, Forte adds a parallel structure next to the user's original sketch. Or the user can ask the tool to create a variation based on the original sketch. So here it looks a little bit different, but still uh, the resulting structures try to stay similar to the original sketch. And the last technique is to consider the, uh, the sketch as defining a boundary within which uh, the optimization can put in more structures to provide support.
you can think of these three uh, techniques as incorporating the appearance information, the sketch, into the optimization by trying to mimic the user's sketch in the generated process of the structures. Importantly, we need to allow users to control this generation. So we provide this global similarity slider. By increasing the similarity value, uh, AI would try to stay as close as possible to the original sketch versus a lower value would allow AI to go a little wilder to generate structure that look more different. You can see the differences between two similarities. And then once the user sees a result coming back, they should be able to think about it and make some edits. And then AI should take into consideration in the next uh, iteration. So it inter uh, allow the user to perform this direct edit onto the AI's result by erasing certain parts of the structure, which then prompts the AI to consider those erasions uh, in the next iteration. And the user can keep doing this back and forth until they are happy with the result. Or they can add more structure if they see this is probably too empty and they want to add a truss. And then the optimization process would try to incorporate the kind of intents in the next iteration. And importantly, we need to inform the user along the way what's the trade off? Because not all kinds of structure would have the same type of structural integrity. So we provide this visualization view, a heat map that visualizes the, the stress distributed over the structure. And lastly, we can go into the fabrication process. Uh, in this case, we use a laser cutter and install the new legs on the quadruped robot. All right, so that is a process of designing the leg as an example of using this tool. So what's happening under the hood is this algorithm called topology optimization that is based on a well-defined, well-established method, finite element analysis. The basic idea is that the process of generating a mechanical structure is given a design domain, you need to decide within this bounding box which elements I want to keep and which I want to throw away. Uh, you can think of it as like sculpting, right? You have a bunch of material and then you need to carve away the, those you don't want and then whatever is left is what you want to create. So we have a design domain, in this case 2D, of uh, these finite elements, uh, Xe, and then this entire domain of elements will undergo the optimization process where each iteration tries to either increase or decrease each element's density governed by this objective function until eventually the compliance uh, converges. Um, uh, with minimum compliance means that with maximum structural integrity given the limitation of the material as well as the user's sketch to follow. So this FEM uh, method is already uh, out there and we didn't change it at all. We use it as a black box. But the way we enable these novel interactions is to tweak whatever comes out of this black box in each iteration. So in each iteration, uh, this black box would spit out for each element a new value. And I'm gonna go through some of the, the approaches that enable the three techniques. So for adding a new structure, we simply say, whatever is on the user sketch, we keep it. Anything else, we follow what the objective function sets. For obtaining a variation, instead of manipulating this uh, xe new, we instead distribute the initial value when we assign uh, the mass, the material, to the design domain. We say the closer the space is to the original sketch, the more initial material we assign. That kind of steer the optimization process towards preferring uh, being closer to the user's original sketch. Uh, this determined by the similarity value. And for the last technique, optimize within, we simply say, 
Uh, we're going to expand user sketch, and then whatever is on the boundary, we we'll keep it. Whatever is outside of it, don't do anything. And whatever inside, follow the optimization function. Okay, the other interesting thing I, I think about this tool is how the user can directly edit the AI's result. So how do you do that? Uh, remember, we have this design domain that AI work with. So we also create a mask of the equal dimension that represent the user's edit. So for each element on this mask, we set it to one by default between zero and one if it's erasing and a value greater than one if it's adding new structures. And at each iteration, we simply apply this mask uh, to the AI's output at that iteration. So at the high level, you can think of it as steering the optimization towards with the resemblance of the user's edits. Yes? Why are you doing it as a multiple case here as opposed to just building it into the optimization function itself or the, the, the loss function? Yeah, the, the other approach is to do what you said, but that involved changing the FEM method, which we tried to avoid in the first place. And in this way, you can also think of it as it's trying to counterbalance two objectives back and forth until eventually it converges. We haven't tried the approach you said. It could generate equally good or even better result. <laughs> All right. So we ran a user study, and here are the results created by the participants. So I think the highlight here is that by using this tool, uh, according to the results here, as well as participants, participants' feedbacks, they were able to explore the kind of appearances that were not possible because other tools didn't address both the structural integrity and appearance. So when using other tools, you're mostly concerned about uh, the structures, but Forte allows them to kind of balance these two considerations using AI. After publishing this paper, we also open source it, and then we let some CMU designer use it to create furniture. Huh. So if you ever visit CMU, maybe in New York Simon Hall, you would see this furniture. <laughs> now it has been, I don't know, six, seven years. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> we didn't use very good material. <laughs> and it's also available uh, for Tay on GitHub. I tried to update it periodically, but unfortunately I didn't have time recently. The last update was in 2021. If you're interested, feel free to uh, download the source code and then play with it. So Forte takes a human-centered approach. While conventional optimization is often entirely driven by an objective function, Forte augments user's ability to design both appearance and structure by sketching, annotating, and direct editing of AI's results. So I think this direct adding, editing of AI results is the most important and interesting feature because it finds a way to assimilate uh, users' editing intents directly into the optimization process, even without modifying the objective function per se. So next, I want to talk a little more about this problem of assimilating users' intents. And I want to switch gear a little bit to talk about um, image generation. So we know human intents could be either explicit or implicit. For example, a lot of the generated AI these days only text into explicit intents, mostly as a text prompt. But some intents are actually implicit. That is, they are not fully expressed, usually or naturally, in explicit forms. For example, if I ask the stable diffusion to generate a surprised face. You can say, yeah, surprise is an explicit intent. But uh, what kinds of surprise facial feature I want is unclear whether what they are. Because I might have some ideas in my mind, but they remain implicit. They are not specified in this text prompt. And I probably wouldn't want to specify it to that kind of details. So the question we're interested at is, how we can elicit users' implicit intents without the effort or the unnatural process of 
specifying them in a text prompt. When we work on this problem, uh, we were not exactly dealing with uh, diffusion models or the latest models. We're still working with generative adversarial networks or GAN. So for those who are less familiar, so GAN is, was a thing <laughs> before the diffusion models uh, took over. So it was able to generate contents from points or noises in the latent space. So each point in the latent space represents, for example, an image. And if you think of it that way, then a vector that connects two points can be considered an editing of this one image to become another, called an editing direction, such as making the face appear to be older, aging. So the question is, um, how can the user discover amongst this large latent space which editing directions will generate images that match their intents? So when we started looking into this question, uh, we found that in the literature, uh, there is something called information foraging theory that's surprisingly relevant. So it was a pretty old uh, piece of work. Uh, it was the, this particular technique that embodies this theory called Scattergather. It was published in 1992, CIR. The main idea is that when you are confronted with a large collection of documents, you can first uh, cluster them into a bunch of, uh, create a bunch of clusters, and then you select some clusters that seem interesting to you, and then you scatter them into new clusters, and then you repeat this process. So you'll see more and more fine grained clusters until eventually all these clusters seem very interesting altogether to you. So we felt this would be appropriate to help us tackle this intent discovery uh, for GAN editing directions. And we developed this tool called GANzilla. So here, the user would start by seeing an initial set of clusters. So remember here, each thumbnail is not just an image. It actually represents a set of editing directions that change the original image to the target image, to the end image. So the user might say, hmm, these two sets of uh, editing directions seem interesting to me because I see what's uh, inside these two clusters on the right side. And then I can scatter them into new, a new set of clusters to see more fine, in a more fine-grained manner uh, how these two clusters edit the faces. And then I can repeat this process over and over until eventually um, I can select the type of editing that really closely matches my intents. So here's how it works uh, in motion. The user can also change the number of clusters or to get uh, more images if they are not happy with the current batch. And then they say they select these two clusters that interest them the most. And then they will scatter these into a new set of clusters very similar to the technique we just saw in the 92 paper. They can also go back to a previous cluster and they can keep doing this iteratively. And they can also test this editing direction on other images to see how they generalize and change the, the strength of applying the editing direction and save these uh, edits for future uses. So how well does it work? Uh, we conducted some evaluations. So here's the closed-ended tasks. We gave participants some reference images and asked them, so here are the target images. Try to use this tool to find the editing direction that changed the reference image to the target image. And the middle bunch uh, were the participants' work using Ganzilla. You can see they could uh, find a match uh, amongst the many editing directions to move the image from the reference more, much closer to the target images. So we also conducted some quantitative analysis. By comparing the similarities, we found that the similarity between the user-generated image and the target image is indeed greater than the similarity between the reference and the target image, meaning that they were what they, create, what they have found out using Godzilla is closer, indeed closer to the target image compared to the reference images. 
The second test we did was uh, running some uh, multi-round, 36-round comparisons. In each round, we compare with 1,000 randomly sampled adding directions from the latent space. And amongst these 36 round, 33 times we found that the user-generated images rank in the top five in similarity to the target images. We also conducted an open-ended task. So here, the user, the participant were asked to make the face in the reference image more followed by a descriptive keyword. So each row uh, represents a descriptive keyword. So by looking at these results, could you guess which three keywords we gave the participants? Each row is a different keyword. Looks like the task is more difficult in the reverse way. <laughs> I'm guessing the top row is like more thrilled or something like that. More thrilled, okay. <laughs> yes? Last row surprised? Yes. <laughs> that one's probably the more, most obvious. <laughs> All right, so uh, the first row is actually older, <laughs> second, happier. <laughs> And the last row, more surprised. <laughs> All right, so to, to verify that they indeed uh, succeeded in some, uh, to some degree, we ran some quantitative tests. We found that uh, in terms of uh, making the face older, age increases by 10 years. And we, all, we did all this analysis using tools from this paper. <laughs> and when it comes to happy, uh, the confidence level increases by 45%, and then surprise increased by 56.7%. This proved that they were indeed moving along uh, this intent of making them, the spaces older, happier, and more surprised. And some other tests uh, include, include using clip embeddings to compare the similarity between these descriptive keywords as well as the user-generated images. So in particular, we compare the, these similarities uh, between the user's work and the top 10 amongst 1,000 randomly generated sampled edits. And then we found that user-generated images are more similar to the free text keywords compared to just uh, randomly finding directions from the latent space. So some of you might be uh, asking, hmm, again, is so yesterday. <laughs> Why don't we just use text-to-image models? <laughs> well, I would say it's still not outdated, this approach, because Genzilla, our tool, assimilates users' implicit intents beyond what text prompts are capable of. And why is that? Because with text prompts, it's hard to describe the exact facial features of old, happy, and surprise that you have in mind you have to look at the results and then maybe tweak the prompt and then try a bunch of results again until you happen to see one that matches what you have in mind. But Genzilla allows users to discover what matched the intents using the scatter-gather techniques. So some of you might notice a tiny detail in this figure I used <laughs> a few slides ago. <laughs> Uh, it shows that uh, besides the being implicit, there are actually more challenges in handling human intents. So, for example, uh, as of November last year, <laughs> when I asked uh, Midjourney to give me a successful tech company CEO, oftentimes it will return predominantly male images. So why is that? It's actually technically a problem called entanglement is because the attributes of CEO and male are entangled for some reasons in the generative process. That's why uh, these models are always generating male CEO images, even though you didn't specify that in your prompt. So entanglement uh, just shows that there is another problem <laughs> in using AI. It causes AI generation to misalign with human values because I don't believe any of us believe that 
human uh, CEO sh should be male. So how do we design uh, ways for users to combat this problem of misalignment? So the next uh, project precisely tackles this issue. Yes? Yeah, we did not, but that's a good idea. We probably should have uh, tried other ways as well, but we primarily focus on taking the GAN structure as is and then construct user interface to interact with it. So this next project is also based on game model. Uh, of course, there are existing approaches to uh, combat the entanglement issues. Most of them are algorithm-driven. For example, interface GAN requires uh, developers to predefine disentanglement rules for each domain and then human annotators to label large data sets. So these are great ideas and they work, but I argue that there are still problems of these sorts of algorithm-driven value alignment approaches. First, it's not possible to predefine universally agreed upon value. For example, what bias means. And secondly, even if you already have an algorithm-driven disentanglement approach working, you cannot guarantee that when it's shipped to the end users, the model will always generate bias-free images or other contents, which means that we need to somehow provide the last line of defense for the users to combat entangled biased generation. So in this project, we work on a user-driven direction disentanglement approach for GAN. So uh, here's the initial images. You can see some clear entanglement issues. Uh, when adding glasses to these faces, for some reasons, uh, the generative process is entangled with gender, male, and age, old. So it, for some reason, has some assumptions that uh, people who wear glasses are often male and old people. <laughs> Okay, so as an end user, when you see these results on the UI, uh, what can you do? So we came up with this idea uh, called global disentanglement by end users. So the end user would sample a bunch of positive, which means with glasses, and negative means uh, without glasses, examples. And as they sample these examples, they can intentionally select those that are different, that uh, counter the entanglement issues, like female with glasses, young people with glasses, and give these count examples more weights. So in this process, by providing the examples, uh, this tool is able to overcome some of these entanglement issues. So the results have improved, as you can see that now uh, the gender entanglement is gone but the age entanglement is still there. And then the users just continue to add more images uh, to combat the age disentanglement. So here's the before and the after comparisons. So besides global, you can probably imagine there are some local things uh, to do for disentanglement. So indeed, the user can say, um, I want to add glasses, so areas around the eyes are okay, you can make changes. But you shouldn't change the background. <laughs> so these two types of masks kind of provide users uh, additional constraints uh, specified to the model. Yeah, so there's a comparison of the three kinds of results before global, after global, and after global plus local entanglement. Okay, so how does it work under the hood? So for global disentanglement, we can visualize the problem as, so here's the gray arrow is an adding direction. So it's supposed to be parallel to glasses, but for some reason is in, in between old and glasses. So we want to kind of rotate this, this adding direction more aligned or more parallel with glasses. So the way we do that is 
by using the user's selected example, weighted examples to calculate this vector added to the original adding direction uh, to make it less entangled. And this, this blue vector was calculated from the user's selected weighted examples. And for the local disentanglement, we look at the futures in the game model. So remember the two masks. So one is here is OK to make changes. Here is not OK to make changes. So we're intersecting with the futures. So these two masks either strengthen certain edits or weaken certain edits to avoid uh, the local disentanglement, to avoid local entanglement. All right, so here are the results by participants in our study. We can see that using this tool, they can deal with entanglement on their own without going through the algorithm-driven retraining annotation process. And compared with some existing algorithm-driven approaches, you can see the quality of this entanglement from our participants are comparable, sometimes even better, which is encouraging because it tells us that uh, the value alignment problem is not just about AI models. It can also be addressed on the user interface level. OK, so, uh, so far I've talked about three example projects, co-designing both structure and appearance as a way to augment human's ability to do mechanical design via interactive sketching, <clears throat> and discovering implicit intents based on information foraging theory, and then allowing users to disentangle a biased image generation on the UI. So this space of human-centered uh, interactive AI systems is still pretty nascent to me, at least the, the last two uh, space, intents and values. And I believe there is a lot of uh, opportunities for future work. So in the interest of time, I just want to briefly touch on some of the directions I'm thinking about in the future to see if uh, some of you might have uh, common ideas or inspirations we can discuss about. So first, for augmenting human abilities, I believe one of the, the important missions for humanity is to support scientific discovery. So despite the tremendous progress we have seen in the past 100 years or so, surprisingly, there's very little changes in certain scientific discovery process. So here's kind of a <laughs> joke <laughs> slash serious example. I asked ChatGPT to describe in picture what it's like for a scientist to work on drug discovery between 1923 and 2023. So, <laughs> other than even the same actor, probably. <laughs> Not much has changed, right? <laughs> the tubes, uh, the lab, the, the equipment. But jokes aside, uh, that's actually the case. There's really not much significant changes in the drug discovery process, which I think is still pretty suboptimal. It's time and cost consuming. New drugs to the market usually cost a billion dollars over 14 years, and that's only guaranteed 10% success rate. And it involves lots of many work in an iterative multi-phase process. So even though we HCI people are good with iteration, but <laughs> Their iteration is really painful. <laughs> they will start with 100 k's of compounds in the first phase to narrow down to hundreds of hits, and the second phase to tens of leads, and then the last phase to narrow down to one or two developmental candidates, assuming that the previous phases are successful. So the question here is, uh, given some existing AI developments that try to help this process, how can we design uh, novel tools and systems to catalyze this kind of AI to actually help accelerate the drug discovery process? So the topic about uh, assimilating human intents I'm thinking about is AI with a theory of mind. So a theory of mind is this idea that we humans have some ways of inferring each other's mental states. So the figure here is the classic uh, false belief test. So the mom asked the child, uh, what do you think is in the box? 
the box labels as Smarties. But when the child opens the box, they're actually pencils. So now someone else enters the room. The mom asks the child, so what does that person think is in the box? So a child with, who has developed a theory of mind would think about this problem from that person's perspective, who doesn't have his own knowledge about the box actually contains contents other than the smarties. So this ability to think in other person's shoes is called theory of mind. So why do we care about this? Because uh, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, AI these days is quite the opposite. It knows very little about the very human that is interacting with it. So just to give you an example, so here's what ChatGPT actually currently sees as a human. <laughs> really, not nothing but a text prompt, right? It has no idea who you are, <laughs> what you are doing, <laughs> uh, what's going on in your mind. <laughs> It sees nothing but a text box. So the question here is how to catalyze this kind of AI with the theory of mind to infer a human's unspoken intent. And would that kind of new knowledge allow AI to be more helpful? And the last direction I'm thinking about is using AI to mediate human communication uh, in support of value alignment. Uh, we have established that there's really no universally agreed upon values. So that's why I think it's important uh, to enable better communication. Existing technologies often make communication more convenient, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, it would make humans better communicators. Every time we communicate, right, we have generated thoughts in our brain, translate them into speech, uh, utter the speech, which is heard by the other person, and then go the reverse way of becoming thoughts uh, in their brain. So this is very complicated and lengthy pathway. A lot of things could go wrong. A lot of things could be improved given the advances of AI. To give an example, so my student Bruce worked on this project called Visual Captions. So trying to, to make our Zoom conversation more lively by automatically adding visuals. So let's take a look. At his, uh, we demo. implemented visual captions as a user customizable Chrome extension for video conferencing platforms. To use visual captions, users simply speak as they normally do. For example, if you're visiting Los Angeles, you should definitely check out the Disneyland and the Universal Studio. Visual captions will automatically capture the user's speech and suggest visuals in the private scrolling view. I actually just went to Disneyland with my family last weekend. Look. It was such a fun time. Users may click on a suggested visual to show it publicly. Inspired by our formative study, Visual Captions additionally provides an auto-display mode. In this mode, the system autonomously searches and displays visuals for users. And in on-demand mode, where users need to tap the spacebar to explicitly request a visual suggestion. We evaluated Visual Captions with 26 participants in total. Participants found visual captions help them explain and understand unfamiliar concepts, make information more intuitive, clarify language ambiguities, and make conversations more fun and... Okay, so even though it's not directly dealing with value alignment, I hope these kind of uh, systems would inspire a similar work to think about how we can support humans to better communicate shared values. And more also importantly, I would like to explore how AI, instead of remaining on the sideline in this project, could take an even more uh, aggressive or proactive role. How can AI directly participate in human communication, not just as an observer and someone who suggests what to show, but as something, as, as some, someone that's, that's really similar to a human uh, communicator in this process. All right, to summarize, um, we have uh, talked about the three things are certain in life <laughs> in 2024 and beyond. Uh, we are sure that AI is and will be <laughs> changing humanity. Despite these promises of AI, we also know there's and has always been and always will be a gap between what AI can do and how AI can serve humanity. And to close this gap, I believe 
we should be uh, building interactive systems that catalyze AI to achieve these three levels of uh, human-centered objectives, augmenting human values, assimilating human intents, and aligning with human values. So with that, I want to conclude the talk. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I was mostly curious about the user's role in the user disentanglement. Um, one question I had, is there any reasonable way to measure the amount of disentanglement that needs to happen? Because to your point, there are no universal values. Um, so perhaps it's always iterating, and we're always looking for different people with different values to kind of provide input, or any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good point. So is there any way to measure uh, the amount of uh, disentanglement needed on that user interface or the amount of effort uh, needed from the user? So the short answer is that we did not provide that kind of support, but it did come to us as an afterthought. So how would users actually tackle these entanglement issues? How many samples they would select? How many ways they were assigned to different samples? I think future world should develop some sort of uh, uh, data logging to observe this kind of user behavior and better understand how they use this tool. Mm -hmm. Yes? Seeing how like, AI can easily manipulate a face into different facial expressions um, kind of got me thinking about, like, in the airport, um, we got, like, I don't know if you see this, like, a line called clear. My yeah. parents like got it so we could just go fast. It's kind of scary because you don't even need to scan your boarding pass. Mm -hmm. It just looks at your eyes mm -hmm. and then it already knows who it is out mm -hmm. of their database of thousands, millions of people. Mm -hmm. How would you say that like we can balance ethics with like having a database that can recognize people just solely on their eyes? Mm. Yeah. That's a very big question. <laughs> how to balance ethics and ability. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot that could be done in the life cycle of developing these kind of AI models, from responsibly collecting training data <laughs> to verifying the models, such as it shouldn't uh, only recognize certain people because they dominate the training data, <laughs> to the design of user interface to inform user any uh, ethic-related behavior of this model. Uh, for example, the, there could be some sort of model car user interface to let the user know some very brief description about how this model works, what data it's based on, what sorts of uh, uh, problematic behavior currently exists so that the user of this system uh, under, can understand that the extent of this model's ability and limitations. So I think there are a lot of work on throughout this entire process of developing and using facial recognition AI. Yes. Uh, the beginning of the game, you also mentioned like people sometimes don't have enough trust to this kind of system and they want to have like, more control and rather than directly That's receive true. the model yeah. output. So how can we balance like this kind of thing and having a more product? Yeah, so in the visual caption project, we already developed uh, the, the solution to your question is we let the user select three ways of AI proactiveness. So AI could either uh, suggest visuals on demand, so user have to press a button. Or AI would suggest uh, visuals automatically. So you see a suggestion, but nothing would happen. You have to approve. Or AI can add the visuals automatically. So you trust it that you can allow AI to add visuals without you doing anything. 
So having these different levels of proactiveness for the users to choose from is our current approach. Yes. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask a question regarding like augmenting human abilities. Yes. Um, so like with like uh, having someone sketch out like a robotic leg versus like having some machine just um, like automatically like make like a lot of robot robotic legs. Um, so what's the advantage of like having this like human input and augmenting it as opposed to like just having it all like automatic? I would say the major benefit is that you can allow the user to express their own creativity. So not everyone has to order from the same manufacturer to buy robotic leg. Each of us can create their own design. While this tool help them ensure that their creation uh, has sufficient structural integrity. I'm curious about some yeah. of these techniques you're using to guide, like Danzilla and so on. Um, it seems like one of the we're often in HCI kind of routing around the algorithm outputs. Like we, we sort of take the pre-trained GAN and mm -hmm. then we're trying to elicit the um, the dimensions inside of it that might be semantically meaningful and so on. Mm -hmm. we're, we're sort yeah. of we're taking its output and then we're trying to kind of work around it. And it seems like if it were possible to directly train these things with some notion of say human similarity, you, you could give people much more powerful levers over this. And you know, what we were, at some level, what we're missing is the, 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 the model on the human side, like a cognitive model or something like that, but that, mm -hmm. that, that would act in the same way as your mask did to sort of be a joint optimization. Mm -hmm. I'm I curious see. if you see any opportunities there, or do you think it's gonna sort of remain hard? Mm. My understanding is that what you refer to is the more algorithm algorithmically driven approach where your developer have to uh, specify what is entanglement. They have to collect additional data, label this data, and then use those to disentangle the model. Or they could have to train recognition models to say, well, this is getting older, this is getting more surprised, and use that kind of additional models to enable semantic control. So if that's what you mean, then yeah, indeed, yeah, that is already happening in the AI community. There's been a bunch of work uh, using this kind of approach. And uh, our work is almost complementary to what they do. So instead of uh, working with the model directly, we try to allow either user interface level at the last line of defense, <laughs> once the model has been fixed by developers, but it might still be problematic, or you might still struggle to find what you want. <laughs> what else can we do <laughs> at the user interface level? And how much do you think that that user interface winds up being co-designed with the algorithm anyway? Like if you swapped out, say, again, Ganzilla or GANs for autoencoders or stable diffusion or anything else, how much do you feel like you would, like let's, let's set aside the algorithm mm -hmm. yeah. behind it, but how much would the interface have to change? Yeah. How integrate are they? Uh, I would say it's semi-loosely integrated. So for both Ganzilla and GanRevel, uh, the only thing that's coupled with Gan is this notion of editing direction. Mm -hmm. That means uh, you would start from some sort of latent representation of an image or whatever you want to create, and then you would manipulate it through the network. Mm -hmm. As long as you have this notion of editing direction, then the user interface doesn't have to change a lot. Mm -hmm. So we actually change a bit from Ganzilla to GanRevel. Instead of just working with vanilla GAN, we're actually working with style GAN. Sure. So it's not exactly the, the, the initial latent vector. Mm -hmm. It's actually the style vector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different, but it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. So that somehow shows we have some sort of generalizability mm -hmm. beyond being coupled with just a static model. Yeah. <coughs> question. Mm -hmm. uh, in, your, in your vision, what would be the main user of Ganzilla? Because I'm thinking in society, mm -hmm. who is interested on disentangling 
there's the data sets and so on. So you mean uh, the last project, Gun Rebel, this yeah. entanglement? Yes, this entanglement, yeah. Yeah, if you care about the quality of uh, image generation, so whatever you use image generation for, it could be making a thumbnail of your YouTube video, creating a company logo. If you care about quality, then entanglement is an almost universal problem. And then those people can use this interface to improve the quality of the outcome of the AI models. Last call. <laughs> All right, then let's take our speaker. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.